Me boo, or are you just going to join me? <laughs> yeah, join me there. Yeah, okay. Um, so thanks, Ben, for the opportunity to, to share this with you. Everyone. I think it's going to be an exciting day. I'm here. Uh, I coordinate the online version of the architecture course at Curtin. So it's um, we do run the program completely online. So we touch on a lot of the topics and the themes. I think none more so than a bridge too far, which is all the clear. Um, but so I, I coordinate. I don't uh, exactly teach into the program myself. Um, but that's that's what I'll be talking about. Um, Boone, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Um, I teach into the program, so I will be giving the academic point of view. Um, primarily, I think the problems for us was around studio. The subject courses are fairly easy to go online, and I will share that when my turn comes. Um, so this is just the format of what we're going to talk about, um, where and how it started, structure, uh, the difference that we find in online students, uh, the methods that we use to deliver the course, uh, what we're doing to integrate it with the campus course and research projects, um, results and some lessons that we've learned. So um, Open Universities Australia started in about 1993 as a way to increase accessibility to uh, tertiary education for students that wouldn't otherwise be able to, um, to participate. Uh, Curtin started running Master of Planning online uh, in 2008 and that was reasonably successful and so the school started looking at other courses they could get online through OUA. Uh, the proposal was put in 2012 to put the architecture course online. It wasn't fully supported by the department at that time. Uh, it was also a, a time of a bit of um, staffing turmoil. The uni went through a restructure at that time so there were a, a lot of things going on. Um, but the decision was made that the course was going to go fully online and be delivered through OUA and so uh, since 2013 it has been. Uh, the numbers that we have at the moment, we've got 170 EFT SL in the bachelor. Uh, the headcount is more like 300 to 350 though because we have very few students that are um, full time for the entirety of the course because the reason they've come out online is because they have a lot of other um, commitments. Most are working and I'll get to them a bit later. So that's where we are. So the, the basic structure of the course, uh, it's, it's seen as being academically equivalent to the campus course. So each of the units um, is the same, they have the same syllabus, the same unit learning outcomes, the same assessment regime. Uh, recently we've made sure that the unit coordinators have been identical as well and to keep this equivalence uh, all the, the session stuff that we use online, uh, who do most of the teaching, our unit coordinates don't do lots of teaching online at the moment, uh, we have session staff from the campus course. Uh, the uh, OUA runs a calendar of four study periods per year, so we have 13 weeks, 13 weeks, 13 weeks, 13 weeks, there's no break, that's why students don't uh, <laughs> participate full time as much. Um, however, uh, our, pro our course has four units per semester on campus and we say a full-time load is two units per study period. So they're doing half the number of units at twice the rate and no breaks in between. And that's tough for teaching staff <laughs> as well at the moment. Um, so, so we have 12 teaching weeks as the, with the campus course. They have 12 teaching weeks and have a couple of tuition-free weeks, study week, a couple of weeks of exams. We have 12 teaching weeks. Uh, one exam week, uh, sorry, one study week, and then one week of exams. So if you're doing an exam, you're doing an exam in week one of the following study period. Uh, the first year units in the course are open, so anybody can enrol in first year units. There's normal prerequisites apply, but you don't have to be enrolled in the course to take first year units. So we get a lot of, um, let's call them speculative enrolments uh, in first year, where students yeah, architecture might seem a bit romantic, but I think it sounds interesting, they'll come along and sign up. Uh, and in, in some of our first year units, we have about a 10% rate of students that never even log in, despite being contacted about it. So uh, our completion rate is 50 to 60%, and that's that's part of part of the, um, the mandate of OUA is to try and be more accessible, but it does bring these other difficulties. Once students have completed or passed um, four first year units, including our academic and professional communications, they can then apply for entry into the course. Uh, and so from there, they'll be able to take second year units and onwards. So that's um, completing or passing four units is seen as um, uh, demonstrating their competence to enter into the course. 
Uh, so a few limitations of this, you can imagine the, the full study period regime. Yeah, quickly. So that's 50 60% will complete all the components, or 50 60% will pass? Pass. Will pass. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We don't actually have that many failures. Like the <coughs> failure rate isn't higher than the campus course because people will give up a lot more easily if it doesn't look like they're going to pass anyway. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll get to a bit about like res the resilience of students is different as well. If you're coming into a class, you've got a whole lot of people around you. Um, they're, they're, that builds a certain resilience, whereas online students are isolated, they're sitting at a computer and um, it's a lot easier to, to stop showing up. And again, um, HEX or help the um, deferment of student loans is is available to OUA students, so they don't actually see the costs up front anyway. Um, so some of the limitations with the, with having to be equivalent and be seen as academically equivalent is that we can't change things like um, the syllabus or the assessment regime. And so we've found in some units where where we've had an assessment uh, that we could uh, make make uh, weekly submissions to make sure our students are continually engaged and participating. Uh, if the campus course then changes the way they do assessments, we, we have to change ours. So we've lost a few of those things uh, where we can't, uh, say, enforce participation if the campus course isn't doing that. There are some other things that uh, when, the, when the online course was first pitched, uh, the department really wanted to have an internship component to it so we could make sure students were spending time in an architectural practice or with a physical architectural practice. But because that's not a requirement for campus at Curtin anymore, that it used to be 20 odd years ago, because that's not a requirement for our campus students to graduate, we, uh, there are equity issues if we were trying to make that um, a requirement of graduation from the online course as well. So, so in terms of trying to get, so say trying to get this course accredited, because there were issues at the time where it, the decision was made to keep them entirely separate and go through a separate accreditation process, um, trying to be trying to demonstrate that we are extremely closely equivalent to the campus course um, is good in those ways because we're trying to reflect what's happening in an already accredited program. <coughs> However, there are some ways we could be, um, say, uh, more relevant to the online environment that we can't because we're, we're stuck trying to reflect the campus program. So this is just what it looks like. I'm sure it's similar in everyone else's um, courses we have. A studio, which is two unit or a double unit of design and methods, have cultural and theory and technology and systems units, and then in the masters, um, something similar. In in the bachelors, all those units are prerequisites for each other as you go down, apart from in culture. Uh, in the master, the studios can be taken separately, and it's capped off with a, a thesis project at the end. Uh, so this is this is how our students are different. Uh, this is the main way on campus. 85% uh, of our students are 24 or younger. Uh, online, 75%, oh sorry, it's the other way around, 75%, uh, 85% are 25 or older. So our online students are a lot more experienced, they're a lot more mature, um, they're coming in, ma making a, a real decision to, to change something in their life and come here. We've got um, plenty who are working in industry, we have a lot of people who are uh, draftsmen who are looking to upskill and, and hopefully get to this, um, uh, get that accreditation. They're, they're already doing this. We've got people that run their own building design companies already and have been doing for years. Uh, they've come into the, to the online course. So uh, older students know what they want and they want it to be relevant. They're looking for something that's a lot more um, vocationally oriented and they um, they have less tolerance for being stuffed around. Uh, location. So this is this is just our uh, EPIN up sites, which I'll get to a bit later on. Uh, the, the login. So I haven't got the exact data on just the student enrolments, um, but in terms of our kind of the social networking site, we have 95% of logins are for Australia. Um, we've got tutors at the moment in Germany, the US, and Indonesia. So that makes up some of those. Uh, and across the, the last month, we had 38 different countries represented. And then this is city by city. So there's about 20% Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane, about 20% each. Uh, another 15% or so uh, elsewhere in Australia, and uh, a handful then from overseas. So, so this is where I was just going to get back to this, talk about the, the isolation. So students don't have a, a, a group or a class that they come and 
uh, sit with every day and see. So that ha having people around you that are going through the same thing, I think, builds resilience. So we found that, find that our students, if they get a bad crit, are much more likely to not come back for another crit. Um, some offhand comments that, that no one would even think twice about um, on campus can really be taken to heart uh, online. And, and it's not, um, I don't think it's reflective of um, people that, that just take things too personally, but it's, uh, it is about having that community of support that's around. So studio culture is something that's difficult. We started recently a, a mentoring program with some students that were in uh, second year or beyond in the course have got together. They've done a mentoring training through Curtin's program, uh, set up a Facebook site for, for all first years to get onto. And so that's, uh, that's one way that they get together. They were all already making their own Facebook groups outside of anything that we controlled. We, we don't control the mentoring group. There's someone from mentoring at Curtin who's um, who sits and keeps an eye on it just to make sure that there's um, nothing untoward going on there but uh, the school doesn't have anything to do with it, no teaching staff are on that. And, um, and so some of, some of the students out, out of that have um, come up with a program they call Alcoholic Architecture. They all get online at the same time on a Friday night <laughs> and critique each other. Um, and, but they, they also um, kind of self-police so, so they know if students, well they'll They'll decide if students are legitimately asking for help or they're wanting someone else to do the work for them. Um, and so again, most, most of the students are mature age already, but all, all of their mentors are, are too, and they really they, they do care about the course. Recently, we've uh, also been putting out a bit more about uh, events that are going on in each of the different states. So I've got um, feedback. So we, we put out an announcement to everyone about Peter Elliott's called Medal Tour, and so that started some conversations with people in different states went along to those. Uh, and a few of them have also started their own meetups in their own cities with the people that are there. Uh, so delivery methods, so how, how we teach will be um, curtains on Blackboard. So some of you will probably know and hate Blackboard already, and the rest of you just wouldn't have used it yet. Um, so we have what we call modules, which are the written up versions of lectures. So if, um, if we give lectures, we often use just the recordings of the lectures, but we also find that sometimes those aren't they're not presented to go online. So they have been written up into online documents. I'll show one of those um, in a minute. We do use our lectures. I'll get and we might talk a bit later about uh, the future of lectures on campus. Uh, discussion boards, which are simple, everyone knows what they look like. Uh, so submission points, all, all our submissions have to be digital. So we do get students to make lots of models, but of course the, the actual submission is either going to be a video or um, a compilation of photos or something. That. Uh, EPIN up is something of a closed social networking site. It is very much like Facebook, but the idea is there that between studio sessions, students can be posting their work all the time, and tutors will log in every couple of days or so. So students don't have to wait a week before studios to get their next set of feedback. Uh, collaborate. So we do most of our studios via web conferencing. That's the, the main part of the teaching. So that's obviously the synchronous teaching and critique for students. Uh, but we also find tutors come and tell us that they see, they can tell that students who aren't attending the sessions necessarily are watching the sessions. So they're all recorded as well. And so tutors can see if students have been uh, watching the material that was presented or seeing the critics from the other students. And one of the other things we have for skill acquisition is lynda.com. So that's um, a, a huge uh, resource collection of uh, online videos, tutorials. Um, for mostly for software and, um, and business skills. So that's, that's what we use mostly for uh, CAD and documentation of Photoshop. So I'll just go and have a look at, I'll show you some of our modules now. <coughs> so this is what a module looks like for us. In second year we're looking at Building topology. So the idea is this was being presented in a, a lecture at some stage and it's just written up into another document that then usually has discussion, discussion board um, prompts and, and often links to other websites or YouTube videos. Then 
so blackboard, this is, this is what blackboard looks like. Um, so what, one way of getting uh, our lectures up, so this is, this is where we put, put the material, these downloadable things. Each, each week has something similar to this. In this case, we've got a particular set of worksheets. We've got the module there. Uh, and then on campus, <laughs> on campus there was a lecture that lecture has been divided up into four sections. Usually there is a thumbnail here as well. Uh, so there's a couple minutes, 17 minutes, 20 minutes has been divided up in given topics. Uh, students can watch that there. If they want to watch the, the whole version, they can just click on the, um, click on the echo center. And so all the lectures are available. So that's taken from the campus course. Trimmed out the stuff at the start because um, online students don't want to watch five minutes of hearing about which room the class is going to be in or what desk to hand in your assignment at. Uh, and then, what was next? The pinup was next. So, sorry. So this is this is the pinup site. Students have got two days to their next assignment. Uh, Tutors, so the scroll goes the opposite direction to what I'm used to. So the tutors have posted um, an image of something for students to look at. So this is all student work that they've been posting as they go over the last few days. I didn't, but maybe I should have um, told them that I was going to be showing this at a presentation today. So uh, this is um, uncurated. This is just what it, what it looks like uh, as, as it goes up. What, what year is that? Uh, this one's second year. So this is equivalent of first semester, second year. Um, so, so as you can see, you can still get students to build models. And this one also, uh, they weren't allowed to use any, any uh, digital drawing. So this is all hand drawing for the first assignment, which is the stage that we're at at the moment. So that's why um, <coughs> the way they do. And just want to get down to another section where, and okay, so this is um, another lecture from the campus course that was taken <coughs> where um, the presentation was done, this is Francesca, we don't have any sound at the moment, but you know what a lecture sounds like. So, um, campus course, we went and, and recorded this, it's only, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. So these aren't, these aren't necessarily full lectures, but they're things that given, are given to the equivalent uh, campus course. So we <coughs> capture that. And so that can go into the iLecture system, or it can go into the ePinup. We try and get students to use this as much as possible, and not, not the discussion board, so there's one place for students to go to. Uh, and then collaborate. So this is something like what the web conferencing system looks like. Um, so we've got there's a chat box for all the students here. Again, there's no audio. Um, this is whiteboard where the tutor is then doing some drawing on top of what the student has presented. Um, we've got microphones for the student that's presenting and the uh, and the tutor. They don't have webcams open at the moment. The the um, the limiting factor on Collaborate is the internet connection of the student that has the worst connection or staff member. So, so at the beginning of sessions, we ask all our tutors to have your webcam on, get, get, uh, introduce yourself to everyone and get the students to put their webcams on so everyone knows what everyone looks like. But then when it comes to actually having the sessions later on, um, we tend to not use the webcams because they, um, they do slow things down a bit. So drawing tools are still a bit rudimentary. We did have a um, go through, uh, give all our tutors uh, tablets that hook in so they can draw directly on top of these. Uh, and most of them have actually said that it's easier just having a mouse and drawing with a mouse. So we haven't been looking at other things to do that, to do with that, but um, hasn't been seen as entirely necessary. So at the time, this is this is what a critique looks like without sound. Looks like without sound. developed all this material for the online course, uh, then to make the most of it, that then goes back to the campus course. So modules and all, all the things that have been developed then become available for use as they're appropriate uh, back in the campus course for the next time those units are run or 
um, there's been a few times where we've had changes of staff taking over a unit and we can say this is all the stuff that was prepared for last time. Um, it's available to you to do with um, what you want. So, so we've got the different sets of material and modules that go back. We've had a couple of studios where we've run, uh, unfortunately because the calendar is different, we don't have lots of overlap. We've got a bit of overlap in semester one and study period one where units are the same, um, but we've had one set so far of collaboration between the online set of students who are working on a different calendar and uh, the campus studio where they're working on the same project, um, and had the online students kind of beam in via web conferencing and project presenting their work to the, uh, to the campus students. And at that stage, the, um, the campus coordinator thought that the, the online students who are going to um, get involved in that kind of thing are going to be the more organized ones. But um, the, uh, Francesco did tell me that they did show up the campus students in that particular time when we tried it. But again, it's, it's easy when you're only showing, like, your best students are the ones that turn up. Uh, and so the other, one of the other things that we've looked at is the unit coordinator now, being unit coordinator over every unit instead of just being a unit is now three delivery mo modes or three deliveries of that unit and that's aside from any um, international availabilities that we might have. So there's the campus course and then the two online courses. So, so we've kind of been looking at, well is the unit coordinator now facilitator of all the material, develops the material, develops a team of people that teach it and, and oversee that also, something like uh, managing a, a project, but the point of them being there is to be the, the academic input as well. Uh, at the moment, they're not, no one's doing any less teaching on campus, but this, this is the, uh, the method that we're using for the online deliveries. So some of the research that we've done is trying to come up with what, what software high hardware students really need. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing really special. Like we've looked at drawing tablets or um, or apps, but if you've got a, a computer, a webcam, and a working microphone, and a decent internet internet connection is really the most important thing. Um, and we've um, got a research project coming up, taking to, taking online students on virtual field trips and trying to integrate them on those as well. Uh, but yeah. Um, I got to Curtin in 2014, so the program was just coming up. <coughs> and there was actually quite a lot of concern at the, from the academic point of view whether we could replicate the <coughs> studio experience. But as Stephen has explained, you are getting a different goal. And I'm getting to a point where you are not no longer teaching the usual group of students that come off high school and you know what they know and you know what to give them. Um, we are getting, even on campus, a wide range of people from different backgrounds. And so I think the programs that we teach needs to assume that the students kind of either know nothing or are able to learn as they go on. Um, in comparing the online experience <coughs> with the campus experience, I think that the campus students still get more face-to-face -face attention or more uh, attention in that sense and as Stephen has explained the <coughs> online students are really really tied to whatever that's happening online so that's their life and if anything goes wrong <coughs> anything you say that even hints of them being not given uh, good feedback or something they get really upset and I think we need to be sensitive to that. One of the kind of slants I'm bringing in, and this has something to do with what Glenn was saying, going offline totally on a tangent, is that I was experimenting with using online on campus for a while. And I have my students presenting on websites. So for final crits face-to-face -face on campus, they have only one <coughs> presentation drawing, and that's to kind of give them the skill around uh, doing a good presentation sheet, but the details of their work is all on their website online. So if we have time, I'm happy to show you the different studios I have, which are all online. Um, we are also beginning to use um, <coughs> online facilities like G Drive. So instead of having a sketchbook, students upload their work on G Drive and we track them using G Drive. We also use uh, Facebook, 
where we get to talk to one another. Uh, and so there's a whole series of things that we are beginning to leverage off from online to bring to campus. One of the experiences I have in Australia, because I was teaching in Singapore for about 25 years, I came to Australia in 2010, is that you guys don't have the luxury of studios. So studios is just like a classroom and they come and they go and if the student is waiting there for three hours or five minutes of your time, um, it's like the need they're finished, they're gone. Okay? So the whole culture of social capital where you're learning from one another uh, is not as embedded, if you like, as it used to be. So one of the things we're trying to develop as well like for example, when you see the um, collaborate sessions, which are taped, and we are drawing on students' work, that can be captured, that can be put online, and students who don't attend the studios can actually go and watch that and learn from from crits, from other people. Uh, so there are different things that we are beginning to integrate. We are also getting students who are who have done a course uh, on campus. They fail. We say go online because they have four. Uh, for semesters per year and they can catch up and come back next year and not lose time. So <coughs> in terms of curriculum, they are equivalent. In terms of delivery, it's different. Uh, and we are able to kind of take advantage of that because your cohorts are different nowadays compared to the old days. <coughs> we are also looking at dynamic curation because Online requires us to document our work more thoroughly because again the students are only assessing everything online. If it's not documented, they don't have access to it. If it is just spoken online and they can't remember it, they don't have the support that they need. So it gets kind of really uh, hard for them. So as we document, we are now beginning to think that that's a good way for the discipline as a whole to capture our knowledge. So we are talking about dynamic curation. That is to say as we uh, record our lectures in 10, 15 minutes, and I think we have the experience that students won't watch anything longer than 15 minutes. So you get very, very short skits, and you just capture that, keep it, um, G drive or Blackboard or whatever, you can begin to access that. And so towards the end, right now, we are beginning to look at the integration of, uh, of our curriculum. So as the unit coordinator, coordinator and as an academic, all I'm interested in is the content. So I make sure that the content is good enough, I make sure that it is properly packaged, delivery. Um, in the old days, I teach alone. Now we have sessionals on campus and online. And for us, we used to have uh, international programs that we are uh, running down, but if you have overseas campus as well, they are also delivering your material elsewhere. So you need to kind of make the material sufficiently structured for almost anyone who has the expertise to kind of take in, take the material and deliver that. So I'm beginning to think of our role uh, more in terms of focusing on content than on teaching, because we can't teach as much. But the role of the academic in terms of developing content is actually much more intense. Uh, which may be better, I don't know. And I think that's, that's something we would love to hear some feedback from. Can I, uh, uh, can I ask you a question? Is it, from the teaching side, do academics teach at the simultaneous step online and face-to-face? And -face? Are they running a course that's... Currently, our academics are all units? teaching face-to-face. -face. We are not teaching online. Not teaching as such. Are you asking about sessionals? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's the same person doing face to face and online. Yeah, and all, all, all our online. So, they, but at different times, not not, that's, not not simultaneously. That's correct. There's a bit of overlap in semester one, study period one, and the end of study period one, they get out of sync. And often, our ses sessionals who are teaching with us in face to face will be teaching online. Okay, so there's no real, so they're separate entities. That there's yeah. no real connection between the online. Um, what's happening online and the face to face? Yeah, no. So Curtin has a separate regime they're calling Curtin Prime, which is students that are in the same Blackboard site as the campus students that are taking it solely online. And so that's just kind of my lectures, but that's ours are completely different sites. The students wouldn't have any other connection. 
unless we specifically make that happen. If you're sorry, guys, um, as a, if you're doing something online, can you change over and come and do it on campus? Just because oh, I'm not getting enough out of this, can I come over? Or is it like it's, a separate enrollment and a whole different it, path, and you have to? It's it's difficult, but it's definitely possible. Uh, we've had so it's it's very easy for some reason. Uh, I guess the OUA is is built to be flexible, so it's very easy to go from <coughs> campus, pick up an online unit or two, as Boo said, if, if students get out of sync or they're on part time they want to catch up or something like that. Uh, but if a student wants to go from the online course to the campus course, they will be credited the, the equivalent units and they will be able to come back, but they do have to enrol in the campus course. And the reverse, so the campus students realise, oh, it's all online, I don't need to turn up to a lecture and all of a sudden your lecture room is empty? Uh, theoretically possible. We've had a handful of students take it without having already either failed the unit or there have been other reasons for them to do that. People, students think online is easier. Campus students do worse online, much worse online than the online students who are used to it. Online is a very lonely place. And <laughs> unless you are <laughs> kind of mentally prepared for that, uh, the students do very bad because there's it doesn't have the support. And I think for us, the success has come from the fact that you have older, more mature students who are much more committed in getting it through, they come in with knowledge, so you don't really have to kind of handhold them quite as much. Yes, so just a real quick thing on that. Uh, online students do have to be very self-motivated and disciplined. When you don't have a set, you come to class with a bunch of colleagues time to do your work. Um, it's just them sitting at the computer every night and there might be the Facebook groups and the rest of it, but they are really motivated and, and the ones that aren't just don't get through. It is a lot, um, a lot more difficult in that sense. There was a question? Yeah, I just wondered whether there, cause there's now a sort of big focus on attrition because potentially there's you know, government funding tied to that and perceptions mm -hmm. the whole way in which attrition is calculated is absolutely bizarre. In fact, I don't even know if you move maybe from online to campus, you might appear as an attrition. <laughs> yeah. but I just wondered if that is then a kind of factor, obviously wanting to do things to put in support, but it is yeah. so much harder and it's always going to be higher attrition online. Is that a yeah. concern? Uh, well, it, it definitely is, but we don't want. So we certainly don't want to lower our standards. So part of part of the unit coordinator's role is moderation. So we make sure that any work that's submitted online, that the marks are seen as equivalent to what would be submitted on campus. But we don't. Uh, OUA has a lot of I mean, the, the pastoral care support type things. Uh, in the school, we don't have a lot of that. We do chase up students that haven't enrolled, haven't submitted, um, but. I think, again, first year has a lot higher uh, attrition rates. Second year and beyond are much lower because the students by then are enrolled in the course. They've passed some units and they understand the process. But it's easy to think, oh yeah, I'll do this online, it'll be easy. Um, even online architecture is not easy. Um, I don't know if that actually answered your question, sorry. <laughs> it, it, it is a big issue and we don't have a, a good answer to try and keep everyone coming through, um, especially when they're so remote. <coughs> Uh, it's not a related question, you've got this really well documented um, material that you've developed in your online course and you're putting it available for the um, campus students. It just it doesn't seem to fully turn up to lectures and well, thinking that they can just get all that online. Yeah, so it isn't, it isn't always and a lot of lecturers decide not to use that stuff because they want their students to turn up. I don't know if that is really working <laughs> in terms of getting students to turn up. Um, they get the, the lectures are all supposed to be recorded and they almost all are recorded anyway so students do have access to watch afterwards. And they do say that one of the reasons they say they don't come to the lectures is because they can watch it afterwards. Of course we've got the data to say that they don't watch it afterwards either. But um, having the material doesn't mean that they're going to either read the material or not turn up to lectures and, and attendance is, is an issue that we struggle with on campus. Not because they've got too much material. And one of our lecturers has said they thought it was unfair on the campus students that the online students had everything written down because they could more easily refer to it than her students that had to go to a lecture and take their own notes. <laughs> I, I think that's also a different dynamic because for me at least and for most of my colleagues, we prepare lectures like two days before the lecture and to deliver work that is totally structured, I think there's a few comfortable for us because you're bringing the latest thing or whatever it is 
kind of free flow that you want to have. Uh, so to my mind, teaching online is always behind because I've given it then the package. Um, the material in terms of its availability, I think it's good, but there's a problem if students begin to depend on it too much. Yeah. Presentation. I was interested in the size of the cohorts for your um, collaborate sessions, and if, I suppose if you've come to a you know a best case, fifteen are the best, or well, twenty five, or at what point do people yeah, start so disappearing? Every uh, the the numbers are really variable depending on when the sessions are as well, because given that students are uh, all over Australia, if not the world. Our, our tutor, we kind of say to our tutors, look, set a couple of sessions or a few sessions a week depending on how many students are in the unit and work out with the students when those ones are going to be. So, so long as they're set early in the study period, there's a bit of a, a kind of discussion board thing. When are the best, session, uh, best times for the most students? Um, but so, so those ones all end up being critiqued. There's not so much um, presentation of material at those, so that's a kind of come along and show us, show us your work. So if there are students that uh, can't get to a session, they're asked to pin up or knee pin up, and then we'll talk about it at the session as well for other students. Um, and so, uh, as always, I'll let you to say that they're always going over time because students want to talk and will talk over more than kind of the time that's allocated for them. Uh, we don't have, there isn't really a number for a session. So it really depends because we don't, we don't have set class set numbers of who has to turn up at any particular time. You know, I think the, the numbers that show up to a collaborate, any given collaborate session are much less than the numbers that would come to a campus uh, studio session because most, most students, I think, still come to those. But students will come when they feel like they need feedback and so that's, it's just up to the tutors to manage who's there at any given session. The actual participants uh, during a collaborate session would be like the tutors, <coughs> we have two of them, one of the students who's presenting, the rest are just listening in. So it's fine. Um, the sessions that I have had with students are often quite okay. The students who are listening, listening in just tend to kind of type in their comments or something like that. Uh, the visuals are out, the, the voice is out, so it's just three or four people but a larger audience listening in. So it works reasonably well. And so on campus, I think students have the seven, like if you break it down um, by the number of hours that we have and the student ratio, it's 15 minutes yeah. a week of individual time. So we ask the tutors to try and accommodate that for the students that they can. But of course, we've also got all the other material that's online for them to, and the, the other things as well. So the idea is that reduces the one-to-one -one time they will need. Of course, that's the idea of online education, but we still need to provide it. Sorry, How do you address the issue of plagiarism? Did you notice any? Because if you don't, if you can't follow, you know, like the daily progress of the students, so how do you make it? Because I had one case, and it's through the e pinup that actually the other student that told me this is on Pinterest, not me who found out. Yeah, <laughs> the sure. other who told me because one student had copied another student. So how do you, did yeah. you find a magic solution for that? There's one? no magic solution. <laughs> I mean, like, similar to on campus, I mean, there was something a couple of decades ago on campus where someone had found a, a really good project in a magazine that looked like the design of the studio project. Um, so it's the same, all, all the studio projects are um, original. Sometimes, because we run it twice a year, then we might be using the same one two times in a row. Um, but. The idea is they're all specific to what to what students are doing. All the um, you know written submissions go through Turnitin, but tutors and the people that are marking them need to read that. We have had a few cases where where people marking an, assi uh, an assignment have seen something that oh this doesn't go with everything else. Reverse image search on Google. Ah, oh, here it is. Plagiarism. Um, and so we do we do have cases of that, but it's really up to the tutors to to be able to spot it. And the idea of the, the EPIN up and the rest of it is that we can hopefully track that it is the student doing that yeah. each week. Okay. So, oh, hang on. We have <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hang on, we've got question and answer time at the end. Oh. I've got like two slides. <laughs> 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 um, so just, just a couple of points. Uh, so our, our cohorts are a lot smaller. We only have 
uh, 10 to 15 in third year units, 20 to 25 in second year units. And again, because we run it twice a year, we've automatically halved our class uh, compared to what the, the equivalent group would be on campus. So, so we get a much wider spread of grades. We do have some very confident students, as I said, some are uh, running des um, design or building design companies already and some come into first year with absolutely no skills whatsoever and, and of course the course has to be written for them. A lot of them get really demoralised when they see these drafting submitting things in first year that, that look, quite, look quite amazing and we've had a few who say, oh well, I'll never be able to do that and so they get really demoralised and, and um, talk about leaving. I'm not sure if we've had any different to leave. Have a lot, a lot more students that don't complete units. Um, Theory and culture units, and I think it's more about age, uh, maturity, <coughs> and written skills that we tend to have a lot um, uh, higher marks in our theory and culture units. In studio units, uh, the, the marks are lower. Again, we always moderate to, to try and make sure the marks are equivalent to the campus course. And I think a, part of, a big part of the reason for that is the smaller cohorts. Probably delivery method has something to do with that, but the small cohorts mean that there aren't a, a critical mass of really good students who can kind of push each other and lift the rest of the class up. If we've got a few good students, they'll, they'll turn up, but there's not the, and again, not the, the culture where um, students will kind of see that be pushed along by all the others. And so, of course, just through the nature of it, we get a lot more multimedia and, and less craft, this is something else we see. So, a few of the lessons, um, all my students are very discerning about the materials that we give them. We need to be very specific, we need to have everything done. Uh, up front as well because they want access to everything right from the beginning um, they, and so they care about doing things that are going to get the marks and get them through the course if you don't make something accessible they're not likely to um, value it and less likely to do it. Um, the, the tutors or the teaching staff that they do have that human contact with uh, is the most important factor in student satisfaction. Um, we can get some really good work out of students that, that come into this class um, and so, so this one was about uh, having that e-pin up and students being able to watch recordings of other collaborate sessions that students can learn uh, and improve uh, without coming to the tutorial sessions. Uh, so staff need support to embrace e-learning. So it's not, we're not having difficulties with any staff projecting it, but it's a whole new way of doing things. And so we've got the, the team that we had that was running the, the AUA course, we kind of transformed into digital learning and are now feeding back into uh, what, what they can, are doing in the campus course as well. Uh, and so the last one, we, the course is sold as being a lot more flexible, and it is for students, but uh, the online teaching is a lot less flexible. So it it's, seems an irony, but given that we have to have everything prepared, uh, prepared earlier, to, uh, lecturers can't write a lecturer on the morning and deliver it. Everything's got to be uh, right up front. It, we're a lot, um, a lot slower and a lot less reactive, and that's again um, a function of the, of the mode of teaching. I think that was all I had. So thanks for listening. <laughs> there were a lot of questions. <laughs> Back to questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of picking up on your last point there, I'm, I'm quite interested in the workload implications. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our staff, um, are they teaching both on campus and online? Um, it seems that the online, because you don't have any breaks over the course of the year, um, when do staff have time to do the research, you know, downtime, thinking, you know, all of those, have, have your staff members increased to accommodate the uh, <sighs> Not yet. So, so briefly, well, this is an increase. Yeah, I never take all that. Like all like <laughs> additional. Yeah. So, so uh, how it works is unit coordinators during the the teaching period because they're not teaching into the units. Their role is mostly moderation uh, and uh, certain other extensions and some some particular things. So they don't actually have a high workload during the teaching period. They should be in touch with the sessional staff member over that time. Uh, the other thing that we're again, looking to do is pairing up staff with um, co-examiners so there will be somebody available um, all the time. At the moment, staff kind of delegate someone if they need to go and leave to, to look after the unit and that's how we deal with it. But uh, workloading is definitely an issue. A lot of the material in terms of documentation and staff are prepared by them. So our lectures notes are just very flim flimsy and 
incomplete and they take it away and really make it. So it requires a separate team as well yeah. of support. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, who are your sessional staff at sort of what level are you currently in? Uh, what level? So, well, they're. They're not just tutors, as in postgraduate students. Yeah. yeah. The our well, current sessionals on, on campus. Some are, and some are practitioners that yeah. are sessional, student, are sessional teachers yeah. on campus as well. So, many of them would have ex quite a bit of experience teaching with us in our units on campus. <coughs> and then they will go online and they know that what I expected of us, uh, expected of the students online. Sorry. Before I get to my original question, is regarding <laughs> uh, uh, the loading issue, so has the school or the university recognized that the way they calculate workload is different for this thing? Because, like, you know, we have that sort of problem that in the logging system, it's only you know you're doing these many hours of lectures, but you're not doing any lectures, and it's like, well, prepare a computer for the lecture, so how does that come? So, so have they? Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a formula that at the moment is seen as being inadequate. <laughs> it does include an amount for if if you're running your unit or if you're rewriting a unit, then yeah. there's more there's an allowance for yeah. time to write a unit. If it's the same, we've got all the material, then it's a lower but there is time in there for the coordination part of the online unit. I, I don't know how it goes for other universities. I've had a department for for architecture for the past two years. Um, we can negotiate. So yeah. as a head of department, if you come up with a case and you tell the um, whoever's on top of you, your line managers, and say, look, we need to do this. This is a time that we think it's fair to give to the staff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it depends. For yeah. Curtin, it is not fixed uh, throughout the university. We can negotiate, but it depends on us making a case for it. Uh, the question that I wanted, really wanted to ask was that in the beginning, you, you, when you were talking about eye lectures, you said it was the future of lectures. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, we are struggling quite a bit with trying to make sense of lecture as an environment, uh, because the problem is that uh, it is often touted that if you can just basically record the audiovisual component, that is the same as being a lecture hall, which we all understand is not the same thing. And, we all recognize that they are extremely boring lectures, but then they're also very motivating lectures <coughs> back in the moment again. So how do you see that as being um, perceived by the university in terms of what the future of lectures is? Is that easy enough to just say any audiovisual Yeah. Uh, for me, I see my future personally as being a tech talker. So yeah. a tech talker. Yeah. So you, you prepare your lecture to be filmed up. Yeah. Um, and then you deliver it, and you allow for the fact that that is going to be that experience. Yeah. So the actual room experience will be for those people who do attend, and then there may be more Q and A or whatever the interaction that happens uh, as a result of that. Um, I've been teaching for like 30 years, and for me, <coughs> the good old days of just coming up, rocking up, and just talking because I know my material so well, is gone. Uh, you need to prepare it well enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to prepare it well enough because you know it's going to be taped up. If you don't do it well, then you know the students who are looking at that is not getting it. Um, when I was in Singapore, our attendance was 50 and above. When I went to the University of Melbourne, it was like 10, 20 percent. If you got 20 percent, you're a great lecturer. You know? um, yeah, you, times are changing, so you got to kind of adapt to that. And I do agree, um, you need to take into account the idea that your lectures will be taped. Uh, that's why I'm thinking that in some ways, this is going to make us much more uh, academic in that sense because you are really focused on whatever you are delivering and whatever you are delivering needs to be good enough not just for your students but for the sessionals who is going to deliver it for you it needs to be good enough for someone who is not even seeing you but seeing you on tape uh, yeah. to be able to get something from you but that kind of changes the whole it thing. does because then they become otherwise yeah. then why are you yeah. not making an animation video and you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. just start yeah. filming stuff and writing yeah. 
Yeah, and I and I get costumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I get this kind of um, angst as well that I need to keep up with technology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, which is what it is, I guess. <laughs> the so dark the effect to... maybe changes um, or allows you to be more flexible or add more quality to other types of teaching yeah. because to once you yeah. record things, then you don't have to yeah. worry anymore. In some ways, and I think to some extent, we are beginning at Curtin to talk about how, as a unit coordinator and as you engage sessionals and graduates, that becomes a career path. Um, for me, my career path was I finish my studies, boom, I go in, teach. You know, I mean, the first lecture I, I taught in the US was the guy came to me and says, You got 12 lectures on acoustics? Teach. And I'm like, Okay, you know. <laughs> Because I know my, my, my material, right? So I can talk in that sense. Um, but now you are getting a situation where your students coming in, your PhD students are being groomed in that sense, and your sessional students are likely to be your graduates and things like that. So yes, I think there is opportunity for uh, the, the most senior staff to be much more focused around the material and can, can kind of making use of the newer mm. staff to, to help build that. Yeah. Here's a new look at the master and apprentice mm. relationship, yeah. completely not having so much contact. Mm. Yeah, it can but be very exciting. Campus, on campus, with the number of sessionals that, that we use anyway, a lot of students don't have lots yeah. of direct contact necessarily with the, the person who's unit coordinator. Yeah. Yeah, um, <coughs> you had a comment about student satisfaction. <coughs> I'm just wondering if there's been any analysis done against the combined degree and the non campus degree? No, we haven't done any analysis. We, um, we our, our um, response rates <laughs> evaluate are really are much lower online as well, despite um, thinking that they, they might be more interested in letting us know what they think. <laughs> Um, it might be that they're more interested in just getting through, uh, but it, it really varies. Again, it has a lot to do with the with the tutors and the presence and activity of the tutors. Um, but we haven't. We should <laughs> make that comparison. Um, Glenn, I'm happy to take questions all day. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm aware whether we're running way over time, but I think everybody's really interested in what you've got to say. So it doesn't worry me that the, the discussion's sure, going to be short, just, short, just with you, shortened yeah. afterwards, <laughs> because there'll be many discussions sort of to follow. So, yep. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned Linda.com. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you engage Linda? Oh, sure. So, um, so for each of the units where, so um, our methods unit say which is communication methods and so we don't we don't want to be spending class time teaching AutoCAD or Photoshop or anything like that so for the units and especially in first year I think it's going to be useful for them to upskill on that um, we it, all of Linda.com is available to all the students but we'll say this semester we think it, or study period we think it's better if you look at these courses and so we can set up playlists within Linda.com where uh, the students in a particular unit will have a playlist, so go through the auto, introduction to AutoCAD in um, the, the you know, BAS 140 unit and then we do Rhino, or we have been doing Rhino in BAS 230, so do the introduction to Rhino. So, um, so that, that's, that's basically how we use it. We don't, we don't follow whether they've done it or not. And the students are okay with that? We've had excellent. students that tell us they wish our I lectures were more like Linda.com. <laughs> yeah, there are yeah. some videos. Well, we tried that once and the students were like, well, what are we paying for? We're learning this stuff yeah. from the online yeah. stuff, yeah. right? Like, why don't we get, oh, I'm having some trouble. Who do I ask? What do I do? And I want to text to text. So yeah. again, we do, we have screen sharing through Collaborate where students can come and ask questions. So they still get kind of the one-on-one -on -one tuition if they need it, when they need to ask questions. But, you know, that stuff, Probably in the tutorials are better than what we would do. <laughs> what we have done is also to take our own Linda.com because yeah. some of our staff would then package that and put it on YouTube. Um, it is not a substitute and we do have students as well who say we are paying for you, we want face to face. Yeah. It's just that you are not there when we are there. You know, if you missed it, go online. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. One, I think, 
following on from Stephen with the experience of the students, and we've just um, the double ASA is potentially supporting a kind of uh, a mental health experience. It'd be really interesting to get a picture of the difference potentially. Uh, yeah, it's a real issue. There are people that are too anxious to come on campus and talk to people, and so they'll take architecture online. Yeah, so and yeah, I, that's, that, that's that a big thing. Really interesting thing. We might mention that to the person who's yeah. doing I think that, that, um, mm -hmm. study. Uh, if it gets up as the front. The other question though is uh, sort of pragmatic back to workload again, given, and it's not only you know, how often you're teaching, how many things, <coughs> how many students, but one of the pushes for this as a university is that it's efficient. And with everything, the care and the curation of the content, you know, that kind of decision, as well as the care in the, the language when you don't have that interpersonal relationships face to face. Yeah, how I would think as a tutor in preparing for the class, what I was going to say, I could imagine there was a whole lot of time investment in that, as well as the kind of difficulties of the technology or the technology breakdowns and communication. So at the end of the day, is it there might be other reasons for doing it. Is, is it more is efficient? It more efficient? Yeah. I don't know if we can answer that. <laughs> I think I think um, it actually helps particularly for architectural staff to move you towards publication. Because you're beginning to collate the material, you're beginning to write about it, to take that to the next step and start publishing some of this work may not be so bad. Yeah. And just write a quick thing on, on that. Uh, we know that our masters is very inefficient at the moment because our enrollments are really low and we have plenty of units with two or three students in them. They get way more one-on-one -on -one time with the camp than the campus students do at the moment. <laughs> but whether we can scale that up um, is, is another question. Yeah, yeah. So we all know that it's uh, a bit of a problem communicating online because you know, you know, you and stuff and you sort of said offhand comments can be taken to apps. I mean, I think some problems where students have taken something that the tutor has said, uh, you know, and had complaints and stuff around that. We, well, we haven't had any official complaints <laughs> along those lines, but yeah, as as coordinator, I'm the person most likely to get calls from students who said, um, yeah, the, the tutor told me that my house looked like a, um, um, who are the little dudes in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> a hobbit house, a hobbit hole or something. And, yeah, it was just some kind of real throwaway comment, but the student took it to heart. So they'll disappear for a few weeks um, and kind of not come back or not like that tutor and so we'll get feedback at the end. Um, you know, if, if someone does call, we can usually have a reasonable conversation around that and the idea that, uh, that uh, and then we have the conversation back with the tutor about being, just being a bit more careful about the language we use. And so we, yeah, we do that from time to time. I, mean, I guess that happens on campus sometimes where um, people can take things the wrong way. But, um, no, so no, no official complaints. We've never got to anything like that. It's more being kind of those those minor things where where a student just hasn't liked the comment and they've gone away or they've called me up and said. So I've sort of seen students being restrained because of that because they're very really careful when they write stuff and they're yeah, so more yeah. likely to write something which is just sort of relatively vague, <laughs> so yeah, that it can't be held against them. Yeah. And, you know, that's Same with stuff. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tony in emails is always something that's difficult um, <coughs> to get across properly. So I know that's that's the same in all professional life. I think like when just the online students, but it's yeah, that's an issue as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If we think about the overall aim here, which is to prepare students for practice, um, have you gone back to uh, look at that, whether they become equal or better or not as good um, as the on-campus um, students? Well, we haven't had anyone graduate from the masters yet, so we've had a few graduates from the bachelors. Uh, one of one of our bachelors graduates, so one of our the best students that we were hoping would push through, got, a, um, got an internship at GHD, and she was asked to mentor a bunch of graduates from their local campus course in that particular um, city. So, so we've got a few students where they've, the, They've kind of gone on to things that have reflected well on the course, but because they've then left the course, it's kind of they're not they're not pushing through. So we can still keep using them as examples. Again, we've got a lot of students who are in their own design practices already. Anyway, I guess it's it's hard. Well, that's they're not really the, the people that we're talking about. But our, our numbers are really low. We've had ten to twelve graduations, or we're about to have um, twelve 
from the um, from the bachelors. So we don't we just don't really have much data on that on where, where they go after it's all their employability or anything. Are they are they eligible to for the accredited degree masters? Uh, and we'll think there's yeah, that next year. Yeah. Well, so so you can do an, a not accredited degree overseas, and if you achieve certain criteria, you can come into the masters occur. So that's the way we look at it. At the moment, it's not an accredited program, the the uh, online one. However, if we're going to accept people from non-accredited programs from overseas, we couldn't not accept them from our own. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking to accredit next year, right? Uh, well, we need students to graduate. Yet. <laughs> and that might be probably the early 2009. We had several uh, pre visits to look at the students' work, and the external visitors had accepted that the work is of equivalent quality to our online programs. I think, uh, as I said, as we said earlier, as we tried to emphasize, the cohorts are different. And so it's difficult to compare. Some of them could post up or already in industry. So the ability to get work <coughs> may not be the same at the same level as our own on campus graduates. <coughs> um, group work? Yeah, we one. still do uh -huh. it. We do it. They hate it even more. Even more. Imagine that. Um, yeah. So, so, so basically, all, all the things that we provide there, we provide within the groups, and so they um, they collaborate over collaborate and discussion boards, and they get their own groups in that. So they have to do a group project. Yeah, yeah, we have group projects online. Too. Yes, they okay. can. Yeah. So, and, and again, you yeah, know. Architecture practices do this as well, different offices around. One of the arguments we made at the last pre accreditation visit was precisely that, that practices are already online and practices are already collaborating with other people across the world online. So actually, we are catching up, we are not ahead of the field. But yeah, so, so if we've got group work on a campus project, that's going to be group work online. Uh, like I said, it's difficult, and especially in first year units where we have so many students that aren't actually that committed to the course yet. So we have to manage groups and numbers, and um, we have we have groups that break down, or particular students that are really difficult and have trouble working in groups. Probably more than the campus course, but yeah, we work with that, and we haven't taken group work out. We still we still do it, and then they. Um, yeah email backwards and forwards that both work on different sections of the file to write tasks up. Can I yeah. ask, how many students do you have in one, for example, design studio course that you show? Uh, so that, um, the second year one that I showed, yes. the thing, so there's 20, 25 and in that one. are they one class or are they divided yeah. in a few classes? No, just the one group. So in first year, the, the open studio that we've got, they, we started off with 110 enrollments in that unit. At census date, we had 89, and at first submission, we had 60. Um, but given the number of students, we want to provide a lot of different opportunities for them to come to classes at different times. So we have three different tutors in there. They kind of divided up the students into groups, and um, but then students were free to attend a class, a different class by a different tutor. Three tutors for 20 something. Yeah, so that's that's how yeah that's how it. But the other thing with online is that because we don't have the set classes, we can we ask our tutors to take two more hours of classes at different times during the week. So the that ratio doesn't exactly apply. The one is to twenty five or whatever we use on campus because that's three hours per week at curtain. Whereas online we can spread it out and just have have the same number of tutors but more classes. So it kind of makes makes coming up with that ratio a bit more difficult. I know one online tutor who kind of has sessions in the mornings, and she says like, in a week I may have three sessions every morning at around nine to ten, and you sign up. So the the groups are smaller, but she has it one hour, one hour, one hour rather than we have on campus three hours everybody there. Do they pay for the first year units? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So at census date. Yeah, yeah. So and they 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 are all notified of that if they haven't logged in or if they're not active. We do get in touch with them. So, yeah. Would you be able to talk a little bit about the 
support that you have? Do you, do you say that as a team of support around your company? Yeah, sure, okay. So, well, well it's mostly me. <laughs> um, <laughs> in so, um, we've got, so there's, there's another uh, fellow that, that helped me who's a bit, a bit more tech savvy. So we've got um, like recording devices, we've got um, a few kind of pieces of technology like that uh, and go around to classes, record things, uh, edit. Put, uh, so, so we will be the ones that edit eye lectures and break them up into the, to the bite size components. Um, taking other videos, going on site visits to record site visits. Um, I think OUA actually at one point had funds for every new unit for that you guys the very to, to document the work. So I think every new unit that came in, there was a, a bit of fun where yeah, someone style. was engaged to sit down and just take your material and do it up. Yeah, that's true. So unfortunately, that's run out. <laughs> but that, that's kind of how, how they were developed, was that there were, there were funds for people to work with the unit coordinators and make those modules. So now they're either modified or the unit coordinators were included to do them <laughs> themselves. Or, and we do have an editing team as well that, that mostly look for referencing and check copyright and that kind of thing, but they're also around to put some material together. So that, so that means that we've new subject or you want to make new content, you have to be now self-sustainable. Yeah, that's, that's right. So every, so when we had, when we changed unit coordinators, half the time they're really happy with the work that was there before <laughs> and the stuff that the last unit coordinator was doing. Uh, the other half, not so much. Um, and so then, so, so for some of those cases, we are mostly working with um, eye lectures because they've said, no, my lectures are the material, this is what the students need. Uh, and so this is, this is difficult because for us, that's, that's not online learning, that's not the ideal situation. But that's kind of what we're working with as, as we get to this point where some of the older material isn't used or we've got new material, we're, we're working with the team to get that, break it up, write it up, and make worksheets that go along with it, that kind of thing. So there are a few people, it's not a huge team, <laughs> but that's, that's what we do. After this next question, we might, well actually we should just break for, <laughs> to have a little good <laughs> cup of tea and then we'll come back and uh, I think Paul, you're, you're next up. So we'll go straight on to the next presentation. <laughs> sure. Then we'll have a I'll break up into the discussion. So yeah, one last question, Michael. Um, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if Paul has documentation, which I think is really fantastic got available for both the online and the um, campus students. Is it um, facilitated or been used or is it kind of put aside in terms of um, um, compliance and curriculum mapping and all that sort of thing? Because you've got really good evidence of what's being taught and um, how it's being taught and that sort of thing. Are you talking about what I just said then about changing things? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that was because, like I said, when we started up, there was a bit of turmoil and there was a lot of staff change over in those first few years. So it was. We had stuff that, if you looked at the curriculum, our stuff fit into the curriculum and it all mapped perfectly. Um, <laughs> and then there was other stuff. And then, <laughs> yeah, I didn't really go off to say that. Uh, yeah, so, so that's, but that, that has been important. So ha having that record of what we've done, and, and like I said, when we've had other staff come in, we've been able to say, this is the material that, that we've had as well, and that works, and they can, they have, there have been some um, as I said, that's great. I'm going to use lots of that stuff as well. Uh, but it, we have had that, that record. We've had, we're in the middle of another master's course review. The bachelor's course had the review last year and some of, some of those things changed a bit as well. So there's, there's that where there's always going to be renewal anyway. So it must be really easy, um, what I'm getting at for like auditing uh, the oh, program right. and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, right. that documentation. Yeah, well, yeah. That's right. If it, for the um, preliminary assessment panels that came along, I don't know if they looked at it all, but we can, we can say, <laughs> yes, looked at all of it. Every, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's very well documented. So we also had a, a website that's got the, um, you know, the, the exhibition, which is all the different levels of different work. And so you kind of can just go click through this, this unit, let's look at the HD work, click, and then look at things like that. So, so in terms of keep record keeping, it's, it, it's not easy, but it's a lot easier for us.
Okay, can we thank Steve and do very much?